Okay, so I can quickly introduce you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our afternoon session in our uh, Friday of the second week in Hawks. Today I have the pleasure to introduce Dimitri Romanov. He's a staff member in Jefferson Lab, uh, affiliated with both the Holdi, the Glue Experiment, and the EIC Center. And he will tell us a bit about data processing and computing techniques for the EIC currently and future. So please go ahead, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, today we'll start with kind of uh, 100 miles away overview of what we have in the data processing and computer. And then we dive into details out, out of it and uh, we will finish with the what's happening on the AIC. What data rates we're going to be and stuff like this. Okay, somebody, yeah, yeah. all right. <laughs> uh, so somebody is visiting F. Uh, 130. Yeah, okay. Okay, 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 okay. So let's go ahead. And uh, we start with the physics uh, and so the words that actually in our, in whatever we do, physics matter. And for electron ion collider, I believe it's to be kind of the new frontier, like 100 years ago when uh, humanity understood how we, uh, how atoms work. I believe that this will allow us to go into a uh, kind of new frontier and better understand what's uh, inside of protons and other particles. And what I'm trying to say here that physics matter and physics what actually uh, give us the ability to build all those uh, accelerators and machines and uh, spend those taxpayers money, right? So, and how we do usually uh, physical experiments. So we have some theory and uh, we actually have some theory here. And in order to have experiments, we build this beautiful machines. Here is the Jefferson lab. You probably already recognize this picture and upcoming electron ion collider. So uh, the problem with this is that uh, what uh, that we usually use have to compare the theory with experiment if theory predicts uh, how experiment work right or not work or maybe need some adjustment and the problem is that okay we collide those particles and we collide particles with target but we cannot put our eye here the only thing that we have is a bunch of uh, we call it final state or more or less stable particles which are uh, going out of the interactions so to do this we have to build our detectors or our detector experiments. And here on the photo is actually uh, the experiment in Gluix, whole D. So I'll be using this as example. I'll be using a little bit of uh, electron uh, uh, ion collider, I mean, uh, CERN and LHC and electron ion collider. So there will be three examples of how we deal with different stuff. So, and those particles kind of being detected in those detectors. Actually, what are those yellow dots that I place here? Detector consists of uh, subsystems, so we call them subdetectors, right? And uh, each subdetector actually can uh, measure some, some kind of, of particles. So we call uh, interaction of particles with detector hits. It's our language, how we usually use it. And it's pretty comparable with what we have in camera. So in camera, we have metrics. Metrics consist of individual elements. So the same, we have the whole detector setup, which consists of uh, detector elements or subdetectors, uh, which actually can be different. And I know that you have already lectures, pretty good lectures, at least from Yulia and others. And I know you are familiar with some of this concept. What I'm trying to do here is kind of build basis or build kind of a system, how this whole thing together works. So I'm, I'm sorry that uh, things might be a little bit boring or repetitive for you. So those detector has, uh, those uh, consist of detector elements, the same like metrics consist of pixels. And uh, what, what happens with those uh, hits are usually, and this is 100 miles away view. Uh, so particles go through detector elements. It really depends on the detector type. And they might be consumed by these elements or go through these elements. And, but what's matter that on the end, we have some electrical signal. So we catch the signal. And usually we don't uh, save the whole time diagram or something like this as a print here, but only some values which are relevant to reconstruct later the physics. So that is what we have initially in the beginning. 
So uh, from the detector, we have a stream of data values. And the next step that we do in terms of streaming and computing, we cut the stream to things called events. So once again, we can uh, compare it to camera. So imagine we have a camera uh, that's looking towards something and 99% of time, nothing interesting is happening. So the same as you know, colliders and uh, fixed targets, whatever experiment don't uh, collide particles continuously, they collide them in benches, and not every bench provide uh, physics that we need. So uh, like 99%, okay, not 99, but a lot of time nothing happens. And we need only some uh, really interesting events for us, which we can study and publish, something like this. So uh, uh imagine your electronics right now and that's how you usually it looks so nothing happens nothing happens nothing happens then bam our physics is happening and you have a splash in the electronics and for example for glux we have like uh 60, 000 adc values so fix it everywhere we use so-called trigger system to actually cut those events and get uh, those with the physics and uh trigger looks for coincidence which kind of looks like our physics if it's how this happening and just cutting two events actually isn't enough in terms of data reduction so uh, here is an example from large hadron collider it has 400 megahertz rate and with one megabyte uh, per event you quickly figure out that it's going to be like 40 terabyte per second of data falling in you so imagine if you have one terabyte hard drive uh, there is a 40 hard drives per second uh, that's happening. And certainly you cannot just uh, digest all this data. You cannot save it or doing something. So what we do, we are using uh, so-called um, uh, levels level trigger system. On each level, which starts with kind of level one, uh, pretty much electronic, pretty much coarse and fast, to something more and more and more intelligent. So on the right is the example of triggering from a uh, large hadron collider. So we have a level one trigger, which mostly sits in electronics, and then it reduces data uh, in the so-called high level trigger. So uh, how actually uh, how will we filter data? How much is the filtering happens? And uh, this table is pretty spectacular. Once again, this is from different CERN experiments. And as you can see, for example, for Atlas, you have 50 gigabyte per second falling on you after, I believe, level one trigger, which finally reduced to just one gigabit per second. One gigabit per second is something we can already deal with, right? So and even more for CMS experiment where uh, it's falling 100 gigabyte per second and stuff like this. Still, uh, there is a pl plenty of data and we have pretty complex scheme. It's called data acquisition system which actually responsible for reading the electronics, uh, making those trigger choices and stuff like this, and finally saving it to the disk. So we will not go into this uh, scheme, but uh, you should kind of imagine that it's falling from left to right, from electronics to more and more and more stuff. This EB, for example, is event builder, which actually try to assemble everything to those one events. So this is how this works. Uh, I have a question here. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you differentiate the, the heat in the detector with the events that you uh, get from the electronics? You mean background noise and stuff like this? No, it's just the heat and events. Okay. Uh, how do you differentiate that? Oh, oh, okay, 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 sure. So the heat is, and I will actually show you in future, you will definitely understand. Uh, but anyway, I can tell you the heat is just single uh, single detection in certain element of the detector. Event is a time frame. Actually, here uh, we have somewhere here is actually event collects all the electronics responses that we have for some period of time where we think our physics sits. So those blue lines is event. So event have all the hits. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another question? Um, okay. Yeah, thank you. I, I had a question. Mm -hmm. So uh, my understanding was an event is a collision of two particles. Uh, uh, well, yes. 
So now, how does the trigger come into this? So let's say a collision happens, and these collisions are continuous collisions, right? They keep on happening. So now, how does a trigger factor into this? Uh, first, uh, collisions are not so continuous. Once again, they are pretty separated in time. So we yeah. actually, in our case, consider that uh, events, and this is wrong, that is wrong sometimes, that events are not happening uh, at the same time. So uh, once again, uh, you see that when event happens, you see a lot of splash in the electronics. So actually, that might be cosmic. That might be not our events. It might happen that just uh, some cosmic particle uh, just coming through our uh, detector. But, uh, uh, but we that's where you're underground, right? Coincidence. Yeah, we, we use coincidence. So trigger system use coincidence scheme. Streaming readout, which we'll talk about it, use more intelligence scheme just to try to figure out if here we have physics. On the later uh, level of trigger, like here, we already do some partial event reconstruction, and we already know. We'll, we'll talk about it. So uh, let me let me continue the presentation. And if you have the same question, if it will be not clear for you in like uh, ten whatever slides, uh, I'll ask you again. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Because we we will talk about it a little bit more actually in further slides. Okay, so, uh, but here what I wanted to tell you that uh, DAQ is called data acquisition system as whole system responsible for saving the data from the accident to this. And at this point, we uh, actually, and that's why I asked you to, to wait a little bit. And at this point, we spent already some slides uh, talking about events, how we trigger them, how we filter them. So now, please forget about this. Now, just drop it away. Because we'll be talking about streaming readout. Streaming readout is something that uh, new experiments is doing, and it's pretty trendy word. And uh, people usually, when talking about streaming readout, they say that, hey, we go eventless, we go triggerless, and uh, whatever. So telling the trigger is moving on right now in our physics field. And what is physics streaming readout? Nobody knows. Yeah. So nobody knows because different experiments uh, kind of use different scale what 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 is the streaming readout but uh the streaming means that we stream something to somewhere right so and uh but at the same time we still cannot process those 40 terabytes of uh information falling on us so it happens that different experiments treat it differently but in general streaming readout means that you try to stream data from lower level electronic trigger and decision what are the events, what are the physics inside the events, either physics that we need, should we throw out uh, this information or keep it, to kind of more slower and smarter pace where you have software and uh, more kind of controllable environment rather than electronics. And also the other thing that streaming readout may kind of think that we would like to save everything, but it really depends on the experiment how much uh, you can actually save the data. So some experiments, usually simple experiments, tend to actually just save whatever they have from the detector. And this allows to actually slowly then go to offline and look where we have uh, physical events and stuff like this. At the same time, LHT and other experiments, they... Uh, do the streaming readout kind of opposite. They try to intelligently uh, filter data on fly. And uh, that is, I'm sorry, just let, let me turn off the sound. Yeah, so, and uh, that is something also called streaming readout. And for Electron 9 Collider, we definitely go with streaming readout, but uh, we don't know yet uh, actually where, it's, it's actually in the planning right now. So we just had one more streaming readout conference. Uh, what it gives you, why the streaming readout good? Uh, so for high luminosity experiments like electron ion colliders, something like this, it kind of allows you to save more physics and allow you to, it kind of helps physics actually. It also helps you to get your physics faster. Uh, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. It also allows you to uh, utilize more software and less, and less um, hardware. And uh, that actually allows you to easily update your experiments and scale and stuff like this. And you will see here on the right that a lot of experiments are actually already in Jefferson Lab and CERN and CERN switch from uh, kind of this hard trigger 
uh, to this scheme. At the same time, a lot of experiments still use trigger or is going to use trigger. And actually what trigger do, you, they're still doing it. They just call it like they are not using trigger, but it's still used kind of has another name. So uh, now we're going back to the scheme and we more or less went into details about how we have the stream row values and we have events. And for example, for Haldi and Glux experiment in 2008, we have like two gigabytes of data. There's more things to it, like calibration and alignment. And I'm pretty thankful that I'm not have to go into details about it because it's pretty complicated, pretty deep and ex extremely boring uh, stuff. So the calibration actually allows you to convert your values to some physical meaning. Like imagine you have your electronics and the electronics tell you 42. And now you have to apply calibration to actually convert this 42 to some kind of uh, answer to your question, right? So an alignment deal with something that detectors are not being assembled in ideal conditions. And the problems and why I say that this is complex because everything constantly changes. So those experiments, they're like beasts. They always evaluating something breaking, something updating, something renewing. And you always have to track of everything so you can actually do with physics. Now, what's on the theory side? And on the theory side, you have to do the same chain, actually. You, there's no way out of it. So first, uh, the software, which is called Monte Carlo Event Generators, I used to predict basic on, on our theory, uh, those, uh, what are those particles? So uh, those final state particles, and that's where theory shines. So theorists have many uh, Monte Carlo Event Generators. There are some kind of handwritten there. Uh, they have general purpose. A lot of physicists do some corrections and stuff like this on it. And then we have to simulate uh, the detector because the detector distorts this data. You have to simulate it. And uh, moreover, as you know, this, there is no hardware yet for EAC. Nothing is built, but we already have the simulation of EAC. And actually, we uh, use the simulation to understand what we have to build. And if we talk about the full simulation, we really do a full simulation. If we have optics, we simulate optics. If we have showers, we simulate showers. If we have background, we simulate backgrounds. So this is actually also computationally pretty complex stuff. So, so it usually takes seconds to generate when when you have something like this. But that is not as the place where we compare the data while we have all the correlations and stuff like this here. It's, it's not where we compare them. So the next step is called event reconstruction. And that is something where I wanted to show you the movie. And I know that you already had a lecture on event reconstruction, but I just want to say that is where we, from electronics, go to really what were the particles, what were the momentums, what were the momentums, and stuff like this. And here's actually some uh, real event reconstruction. And we actually, once again, will go, what is events? Uh, what are the hits and stuff like this? And I actually, let me click on it. And yeah, yeah, I want to continue. And I hope it will be loading. And while it's loading, I will describe what you will see. So this is a real experiment, Glux experiment on Holdy. And uh, yeah, it, it will take some time to load. And my computer hang. Okay, so, uh, but before you will see something like this in this, uh, this is called event display and we have animated event display where we have time. So you see those tube correspond to this one. And this calorimeter lives actually in this box. So what you will see is absolutely real experiment. It was, uh, uh, taken in 2018. This white thing is actually a target. So the beam coming from this direction or from this direction hits the target and actually then the physics and everything happen. So let's see how it works. It uh, will need some time to load. Yeah, so it's almost loaded. So the time is in nanoseconds, and you see that this event stands in minus five nanoseconds, which means that uh, zero nanosecond is when we think the beam particle hit uh, the uh, uh, the beam particle actually hits uh, uh, the, uh, the target. Yeah, looks like with the zoom uh, screen sharing, 
it actually pretty slow on my laptop. Yeah, okay, so that is happening. You see all those lines that appearing here are actually hits or uh, the detector responses. And this curly line, which is actually flying uh, or things and other trajectories are reconstructed particle trajectories, how we think that particles flew out of the target. Uh, and the time once again is in nanoseconds. So whole event actually went in like 26, 30 nanoseconds before the particle hit the kilometer. Did you see it actually on the zoom or not? Was it smooth or not? Looked good on my end. Okay. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. So uh, this is uh, once again graphical of what is reconstruction, what is hits, and uh, what is the other stuff. Okay, let's go further. And I'm sorry, I hope you can, yeah. Probably have to close it. Okay, so event reconstruction is pretty, as well as simulation, is pretty resource hungry thing. And as you can imagine, we have a farm right in the Jefferson lab to actually process the data. So DAQ is here, and after this, after data is getting to the uh, disks, uh, we have a different farm nodes that can uh, calculate the results of line. And it actually takes months sometimes to recalculate all the data. So what is depicted here and what we have in Jefferson lab is kind of classic conventional scientific computing scheme where you have users submitted jobs, you have those farm nodes, they might be CPU or GPUs, and you have some shared disk space. Uh, at the same time, uh, what is actually trending right now and what we will be using for electron ion collider is geographically distributed computing, where uh, different institutions agree together to share their computing resources and uh, to distribute those computing in different places. So one of the notorious and probably largest uh, such computing network is in CERN. And uh, you can see that in CERN, only 20% of data is uh, com computed using uh, CERN itself and everything else get uh, computed on other tiers. So finally, after all the step and event reconstruction, we go into this final analysis, which uh, where physic physicists actually check the physics. So, uh, and if you look very closely, you can mention that, uh, you know, you have those points on the top and the bottom. And basically at this stage, you already have all correlations, but you have to go through the much, much more steps in order to work with the physics and get your physics results. So the question is, can you compare hits to hits or dots to dots? And actually machine learning is uh, the answer that we're actually now looking for. So we are going into dive into machine learning and its applications. You see the problem with machine learning that for smaller and simpler experiments and pretty much works uh, and you can replace uh, a lot of stuff with machine learning. For uh, more complex experiments like CERN or, LH or LHC, or I mean it's CERN and EIC, uh, it's just too complex, you cannot simply do this. So let's go to the different AI examples. So one of the rewarding, most rewarding stuff is striking, right? You have excellent presentation from Gagik uh, who talked about the machine learning and tracking and stuff like this, because if we have computation, those tracking takes like 94%, for example, for whole D. And if you can save on it, you can literally save millions of dollars. And if you look at industry, you will figure out that uh, there's a lot of things that looks familiar. Like there's a segmentation, aha, we can use it for tracking. There's a object tracking, aha, we can also use it for tracking. There's a human captioning where we can, where machine learning can actually name you things pretty well. And we can do this to name, for example, uh, what are the physics inside there web. But on the reality happens to be much more complex. First, we have uh, our data is pretty sparse. What I mean is uh, when we go into this connecting the dots, uh, usually we need precision like microns. And 
uh, the uh, distance between different dots might be meters, right? So there's huge amount of uh, in the special uh, resolution. And uh, as I said before about alignment, we have pretty complex geometry that's constantly changing. And with alignment, the geometry might be not that ideal. You have to uh, kind of work with it. If you work with machine learning, you have to somehow uh, process it too. And finally, when we talk about this um, kind of uh, complex detectors like EIC or CERN, uh, we talk about really high dimensionality, like really many dimensions, and it's really difficult to train and do the stuff. Anyway, now there's a lot, a lot of research goes into the how we apply AI and machine learning in our field. And even with tracking, uh, there are breakthroughs, which actually provide with very good results. And the other uh, field, which is pretty novel and uh, kind of uh, is AI-assisted optimization. So imagine you have a detector and uh, it's on the development stage, like we have on AIC. And you can kind of decide on the shape of this detector or maybe some technical aspects, how to build it better. So uh, before you would actually hire a postdoc who would be uh, do a lot of simulations, uh, trying different parameters to find what is the best thing. And now we can do this with AI, uh, which actually pretty uh, handle multidimensionality pretty good. And we already tried this and this worked actually pretty good. But the question is, can we then optimize, for example, whole EIC and whole bunch of detectors so they optimally work together? And that's something that we are doing right now. And I already did it for tracking where we have uh, several detectors working together. And it actually pretty works pretty well. So in this case, uh, AI gives you kind of absolutely novel thing that no experiments did before because we are not right now on the planning and optimization phase for electron ion collider. So if we talk about electron ion collider in 10 years, we say that all aspects of the experiments can benefit from application like everything, operation of accelerators, beam delivery, simulation, design of new detectors, planning, and even budget. So that our attitude, but not only that, uh, that actually give us uh, something new. Have you ever wondered how Tesla safe driving cars work? I actually wondered, it's really interesting. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into details too much on it. But uh, if we say that Tesla actually operates on cameras, so the cameras is the main source. And uh, it has traders and data sensors, but they are optional. Uh, the car should, should be able to operate by cameras. And streaming from cameras is not that large or not that kind of uh, big amounts of data, but the analysis that you have to do online is pretty complex. And moreover, you have to be very correct with this analysis because uh, life uh, is the hands of the car, right? Or death or injuries. So that is pretty important. And what uh, happened with Tesla when they started to do this, they did uh, uh, networks of uh, different machine learning networks predicting and looking at different aspects. And it happens that when you train these neural networks, you quickly come up with even simple training require you some crazy amount of GPU hours that you need to train just simple things. So what they do at Tesla, they did their own computer for, uh, for, uh, for training and actually working with GPUs. And the same did uh, actually all major players in AI right now, right now. So they call it NPUs like neural processing units or TPUs like tensor processing units. But anyway, those are machines that uh, speed up those things pretty fast. And even more to this, if you look and if you like sci-fi, I pretty much advertise you after this meeting when you have time, go to this link and look at uh, Tesla Dojo machine. Uh, that is a supercomputer that they built to train their neural network. And it's just amazing. It's, it's just, even if, even if it's absolutely advertising and uh, whatever, even on half, it's absolutely amazing. It's sci-fi getting uh, real right now. So, uh, but uh, what it means for us, 
it means that actually right now they are using it for as their competitive advantage, but in several years, such devices will be on the market and we have to utilize them, especially for something like electron ion collider. And uh, actually where we are with that. And uh, with that, actually the picture is not that, not, not that pretty. So uh, you maybe don't know about it, but uh, for HEP software, and we usually use a lot of HEP software. So there was a huge problem to go from single thread to multi-threading and kind of start utilizing those multiple calls in the most official way. And right now there are successful projects that work on GPU. One of them is uh, Lattice QCD in Jefferson Lab. But, uh, you know, we are completely not there. And for electron ion collider, we understand that we will have a lot of those TPUs, NPUs, and other, we call it heterogeneous so, uh, hardware, and that our software uh, have to actually work with it, but it's not where we are now. Why this happening? Let's go look uh, if this one is a software, because if we look at this chain that we have for data processing, I could say that there's just a lot of software that's basically all is the software. What languages and uh, other technology we use? And as you can see, mostly now we use C++ and Python and uh, they happens to replace Fortran. And actually you, you can smile, but there are still Fortran codes that we run and nobody already understands what is the source code of this Fortran code, but uh, we're still running it. And if you say what is the problem with C++, if you look at uh, C++ multi-threading, it was standardized only in uh, C++ 11, which actually didn't happen on this time frame, but uh, this happened much later. And it's not that there was no or no this multi-threading, but actually, uh, you know, it's kind of a flag that shows you how things work. So you can say what it was language or maybe what was the problem? Was it the problem that uh, software teams is constantly understaffed and need more manpower? Or maybe that's because a lot of software is written by physicists who maybe don't know all the best practices of the software development. I say no. Not only that, if you look at something like Electron Ion Collider, and uh, you know, uh, I, I, I take, took this from the Douglas talk about the software, uh, that um, it has a lot of components. And uh, those components has uh, a lot of algorithms to reconstruct them and then get data together, reconstruct this and whatever. Some of these algorithms are slow. Some of these algorithms are fast. Some of these algorithms need uh, uh, results from previous algorithms. Uh, some of them can be run on parallel. So there is a pretty complex uh, thing how you should schedule it to be really effective in terms of multi-threading. And if you add something like GPU or a uh, few other FPU, NPUs, TPUs, whatever you use to there, you will get even more, uh, uh, even more complication with that. So it's kind of pretty complex how you should schedule everything to do this. So and we actually do this. So that is uh, actually uh, the scheme of the scheduler for LHC and actually now we're using the same software uh, that they use. I mean, this is one of the software for Electron Ion Collider. So now let's go and uh, go through this, all those boxes. Uh, okay, I'm just kidding. What I'm trying to say that it's pretty complex task and it's pretty complex to solve. It's maybe really easy to change one single algorithm to work from uh, 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 old way to GPU or something or machine learning, but it's really kind of challenging task to bring this all together and allow this all together to work in a pretty separate way. So talking about software and I will be switching to electron ion collider right now. So uh, for us, it's all easy. We don't have DAQ and we don't have real data right now. So what we have is uh, usually the small Monte Carlo generators for simulation, reconstruction and analysis. So we have actually years ahead to include all other things. And here is an example of our 
actually software stack just for you to know how it usually looks. So we have Monte Carlo event generators, actually a lot of them for Electron Ion Collider. We have software for the full simulation. And then we have Juggler, which is uh, that hardware with this uh, scheduling and all those stuff algorithms. Finally, there are analysis and benchmarks, which usually physics write. And all this is just a piece of it. And another piece that we call it DevOps, and uh, that is something how you run this automatically or do something like, okay, I changed something in the detector and initially our servers start to do some work so you can see the full response of your change. So that is how the software for Electron Ion Collider now working. Now we can go back to the scheme and actually Further, I will have just several uh, slides about EIC, data rates, how we're going to take data and how we're going to process it. So if you have any questions to all this processing scheme and what I was talking before, just tell me uh, the questions. Uh, so maybe it's a good time. Maybe we can ask them later, but yeah, for you just to uh, switch to something. Should I consider there's no questions? And the questions about the went uh, uh, kind of gone? No, I still have that doubt. I mean, <clears throat> from what I understood was uh, you have events, which is the collision of uh, the target and projectile. And yes. that, at that instant, all of our uh, detector systems are just firing up. So now the trigger allows us to Take in this data, I mean, I, I still don't understand how the trigger factorizes into this. Uh, so uh, you can imagine that all triggers was just a, a complex coincidence scheme. Coincidence means that it works. Uh, so for example, you have response from this detector. Oh, actually, I have a backup slide. So I'm sorry again, I will say, you, I will I will show you it in future. So I have a slide exactly with this thing. So I will show it in the end because in the end of the slides, okay? So we we'll talk to you again. <laughs> Any more questions? Are there any uh, computing time advantages or disadvantages? Um, I know that for, for instance, at, some, at something like CERN, they will collect on the upwards of 600 million collision events per second. Yes. Uh, is, the, uh, is there any limitation to the data processing? Uh, so there are a lot of limitations. What do you mean exactly? So what, what, what kind of limitations you are talking about? Uh, yeah, um, I guess, how, how would uh, uh, ML on this, uh, how would this impact that in general? I guess is I just have one an open-ended question. Well, uh, yes, uh, so currently we cannot. So, uh, okay, so how this impact? Uh, we have a lot of data that coming on us and we would be glad to process everything online. So just when experiment running, we would have uh, all the physics kind of instantly, all the physics and physics can go and work. Unfortunately, it's not happening. And uh, you actually, I know that you had Thomas uh, talk about uh, how you uh, detect anomalies and how you detect bad runs and something when, when something happens. So, right. So we still try to be as much to uh, get online as much events as possible and especially streaming readout uh, kind of uh, tries to bring it closer uh, those data taking and getting the results as close as possible. Because before data taking and getting results were years, just, just kind of years, uh, kind of. Uh, for example, when I was a student, I processed data that was, I, I, and that was in 2007, something like this. And I processed the data that was taken in 97. Can you imagine that 10 years? So, uh, and right now it's still months and we would be glad to have it like a minutes. Uh, it's not, we, we are not there, but we are trying to get those things closer and closer together. If this answers your question. Yes, thank you. All right, let's then probably go forward with CIC. There will be a more question time afterwards and we have not so many minutes left. 
So what we have uh, with data specifically on electron ion collider. So as you know, uh, probably from Douglas talk. Uh, so quite recently we have different proposals for detectors and the one called XJ actually win, but don't be confused that I will be showing some uh, different from Asena, XJ, whatever, all proposals were pretty kind of uh, close together uh, and pretty much very well uh, actually processed. So uh, this is the simulated data rate for EIC and you get something like gigabits per second or 60 gigabits. Don't mess it with gigabytes, those are gigabits, uh, so something like this. That's what we anticipate in terms of EIC. And if you look in terms of how many uh, pixels or those channels that we have, we anticipate roughly something like two and five millions of channels. Uh, which means that we are kind of have more channels that average LHC experiment, but we have uh, less data uh, than they have. So to this is our streaming readout scheme for electron ion collider. And uh, those green boxes as electronics just working close to experiment. And then we start pretty aggressively uh, apply filtering of the data, zero suppression, and then uh, that goes pretty much to the disk. So that is another uh, way of presenting actually the same scheme. So we have a detector and first we have uh, data suppression algorithms right after the stream. Uh, then the stream modifies and gets to online data filter. And at this point, we already anticipate that we will reconstruct part of the data. Do you remember when I answered your question, I thought that we we're trying to bring it together. And we still will save data for offline. And with offline, we'll try to, because offline you have to do some recalibrations and stuff like this and it's mentioned over here, uh, but still we hope and you see the data reduction from 100 terabits per second to 0 0.1 terabit per second in the end, but still uh, we anticipate it to be much closer with the streaming readout. And then uh, that is actually a computing model, uh, we call it butterfly, because probably because of, of the wings. And the idea is that, uh, so there are two labs like Jefferson Lab and uh, the CDCC is actually BNL. So it's Jefferson Lab and BNL. And we uh, want to store the data, all the data in between those and actually do some partial processing out of it. And having all those data over here, that's going to be easy to share to the public resources like Open Science Read, NERSC, and others, as well as to universities. So it's going to be kind of centralized like this. And when EIC will start working, we anticipate that it will be gaining and gaining and gaining momentum. So it starts small and then getting more and more. And that is anticipated first three years of EIC running. And you see that they are going to be uh, kind of from 0 0.4 petabyte or 4 petabytes to something like 100 gigabit per second streams that we will have to uh, do. And the same if we go into the number of processors that we need to process all the data uh, in 30 weeks. Uh, so you see that uh, how this increases and how we will need more and more computational power. So uh, if we are getting so electron ion collider computing summary, so I would say that our data pipeline will be a streaming readout uh, that actually then go to uh, computing, which is kind of resembling what is done for cell. We anticipate a lot of AI and machine learning algorithms as well as a lot of heterogeneous uh, hardware. So I already talked about uh, this computing models that we anticipate. We also anticipate the data around 100 gigabits uh, per second uh, that we have to deal with. And uh, one tenth of this data probably will be kept on disk forever. And there is a lot of other details like how we're going to preserve data and uh, the data is going to be open so everybody can actually get this data and uh, check their physics on it. But this is just to be defined. So this is what we're actually designing right now. And finally, I, as Julia and Douglas, we work for Electron Ion Collider Center at Jefferson Lab. And now we have, and I would like to advertise it also as Douglas, we would like to open the fellowships. If by chance you are interested inside of software or maybe machine learning, 
or something uh, like this, uh, it's actually pretty good for application for these fellowships. And that's it. So we can go to the questions if there's still a question. And I know about your question. Let me go to some. Uh, let me go to some uh, backup slides. I guess I should have it. No way. No, I'm sorry. I think I don't have this exact slide. So, do I understand you correctly that uh, the question you have is that how on the electronics basis you actually trigger determines that the event uh, should have some physics, right? Uh, okay, maybe I have another backup of this uh, talk where I didn't delete the slide because I was looking at time. Do we have, uh, do we have any other questions meanwhile? More questions for our speaker? Uh, I have a totally unrelated question, maybe a little bit mm -hmm. out of the field. Um, are there any instances where quantum computing might be advantageous to implement? Well, yes. Uh, so we are looking into that. And uh, we actually anticipate uh, that maybe not in 10 years, but maybe in 20 years, it's going to be uh, pretty much kind of uh, already mainstream and usable. And uh, there are kind of actually a lot of uh, small projects are now going on with quantum computing, uh, such as once again, trying to do tracking fast, but also a lot of uh, Monte Carlo simulation utilizing quantum computing and quantum uh, algorithms. Moreover, uh, you, you may not know, but actually right now, Jefferson Lab uh, physics deputy is from quantum computing uh, environment. And we anticipate that the Jefferson lab will go into kind of this way also, that's it, gonna be a second profile for the Jefferson lab, like quantum computing. So yes, uh, we kind of anticipate uh, pretty much uh, uh, that it's gonna be our future and not only TPUs and NPUs, but also- uh, quantum In that case, a follow-up, would those, would those be augmenting the tech the techniques we're currently using or are we looking into uh, essentially developing new techniques uh well i would say both because uh i think that uh while you already can use quantum computing right but it's still closer to its infancy right so as well as it will be developed i believe more and more will be uh used uh, with this so for example if we take machine learning so uh, we started to use some machine learning 20 years ago. And uh, when the boom happened, many of physicists kind of, hey, machine learning, we, we just use it. And what, what, what's new about this? And uh, maybe not that long, but I anticipate that something like this will be for uh, quantum computing also. Like in 20 years, somebody will say, hey, everybody's using quantum computing and we're not using it. Come on, come on, come on. We have to uh, we have to hire more people and do more algorithms moving to quantum computer. I would anticipate something like this. Does anyone have any more questions? Please take the opportunity. If you don't feel comfortable about speaking, you can always write on the chat. Yeah, I, I have to go to this first question uh, about this sure. trigger. I, I, I was sure, unfortunately, I leave a slide where I uh, actually showed uh, some real experiments, how in the experiment trigger works because um, because I just figured out that, that my talk is just too long. So, uh, but anyway, so uh, the coincidence scheme is basically this uh, green line on the slide. So we just look for particular coincidence in the electronics uh, signals, which might say that this is event. So uh, this is uh, this might be looking something like our physics is looking. So this is pretty pretty simple uh, kind of uh, 
description about it, but that's what is happening. But once again, we have different levels that we're talking about the, this pretty electronic levels that, and, uh, but uh, you first have to go through this level to kind of, if you have coincidence in electronic signals, once again, look at this uh, green line in, uh, in amplitude and time, between different systems, then you start thinking if it's more uh, something that we are looking at. And on the uh, kind of more sophisticated trigger levels, we already partially reconstruct the events and we understand if they are particles, other these particles look like, for example, um, I don't know, example, you are looking three particles, there should be proton, gamma quant, and electron. Uh, so, and they should, should have some kind of special order. So you are looking, are there any tracks or hits that looks like this proton electron? Uh, and and if they are, you will say that uh, it's probably worth taming it and you are passing it uh, next to the uh, DECU chain. So, but this is happening already on the higher trigger level. Uh, and once again, if we go back to this DECU scheme, that's actually what is happening. So the slow level happens on the here on the electronics, and those the blue dots is DC, which means data collectors. So they collect data from uh, different electronics, and let's go to different uh, to the second level of triggering. For example, that's for uh, experiment, where for Glux experiment, where we decide uh, not only that something happens inside each individual detector, but uh, the the data between them corresponds. And if it corresponds, it went to event builder, which already collects all the information from all devices. But then it goes to the level three trigger, which actually decides uh, already do some partial reconstruction and still thinks, is it worth saving or not? And if yes, yes, it goes to the rate and then save to the farm. Could you go to slide number 12? Yes, yeah, sure. So here each peak, now that these are uh, N number of detectors, right? Each line is a signal on a detector, yes. right? Yes. Now each peak corresponds to a event, a collision. Well, yes. Right? No, so no, each now, peak corresponds to a hit. Each peak is a hit. So this yellow dots, uh, we kind of depict hits here. I'm sorry. Event is everything between blue lines. Event is all those recording between blue lines. And each those yellow dot is a hit. But uh, if the peak is not there, it's just the background noise, right? Yes. So you're considering the background noise to be an event as well? Uh, well, sometimes yes. Sometimes we have, uh, and we uh, kind of do this only on later level that we anticipate that if there's really physics that we need to know, yes. Oh, so like my understanding of the coincidence scheme was that each of these peaks you say come from the same event. Yes. That's how coincidence scheme works. Yes. Yes. But now each peak, uh, uh, like, so you're saying this peak is not an event. It's just the uh, track, uh, track hit. Yeah. So, so we don't, uh, so those peaks are just happening in time. And if those peak happening in some pattern, uh, then we call it event. Okay. And then we start uh, tedious work to figure out is it really event or that was some noise or whatever, or maybe cosmic or something. And we are pretty effective on this. But uh, you have to understand that all this, uh, that all this physics is based on statistic. Right. So once again, I would like to show you this slide where we, for just several months, we get two petabytes of data with 150 billions of events. So this is pretty uh, outsize what is called big data and whatever. And we don't care if uh, in some cases we are wrong. What we need is to be uh, statistically sufficient to be right. We're taking it by scale, by the number of uh, those information, not one particular mistake. Any more questions for our speaker of today, for Dimitri? 
we still have some minutes because we started a bit late, so we can stay until 2.35. Well, yeah, I guess there is a meeting in 2.30 uh, with this social gathering, uh, no? The social gathering is at 2.45. Okay, so it's 2.45. Okay, yeah, so then I probably was wrong when I delete the slides, but anyway. Yeah, no, I mean, the session was supposed to end at 2.30, but since we started a bit late, I'm giving some more minutes to see yeah, if there are more yeah, questions. Yeah. Or... Yeah. So if you'd like anything on the software or whatever site of the EIC or, current experiments or whatever.